Hello, my name is Luciana Tellez. I am the CSD 2014 Public Relations Officer. Um, and I am here with Mark Shaw, who delivered the closing keynote address for the conference. Thank you for coming, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, and they're all pretty much interrelated as how organized crime operates in developing countries. Right. And my first one is that uh, you are the director of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, which is a network of experts dedicated to craft strategies and counter organized crime. And at the launch of the Global Initiative in September of last year, James Cocaine suggested that sometimes there is something to gain in terms of security from negotiating with yeah. armaments. How accurate do you think this is in fragile states? I think the reality is in some places the power brokers are, are people who also control illicit activity. And so at the launch of the Global Initiative, there were two views in that session. Uh, there were people in the audience and part of the network, because remember the network has a, a wide array of views. Uh, people, particularly on the law enforcement side, who made the point that you can never negotiate with criminals, um, or people involved in illicit uh, um, activity. I think it, it may the word criminal may not fit perfectly in most such cases. And there were other people um, on the spectrum who who felt that as the power brokers in particular communities, those people had to had to be talked to. Um, my own view is a bit more, I hope, of a nuanced one, which is to make the, the point that it's very, very context-driven. Um, and uh, I think the key issue, which is often missing in the international discussion around the engagement in uh, such fragile communities, is to understand people, uh, the political economy of those communities. And very often there are interventions by outsiders doing programs or political interventions or uh, uh, providing assistance in some form or the other, without really understanding the political economy uh, um, of, of those areas. And so I think there's still a lot of work to do from development agencies, if you like, uh, uh, primarily to understanding illicit accumulation. Uh, and at least in my view, development actors, when they are stepping in, uh, should, should be careful that they don't uh, strengthen some actors over others, uh, particularly those engaged in, in, um, in illicit activity. I think one point to emphasize is if you are engaged in mediation to end conflict, you don't want restrictions on who you can talk to. Uh, uh, but I think you at the same time need to recognize uh, the, the backgrounds and the positions of each of those actors. Uh, because sometimes people portray themselves as uh, uh, politically legitimate uh, uh, community leaders, but they may be bolstered or reinforced by this activity. Well, in line with this same question, pretty much, you were we were just discussing, in, well, you were just discussing in your closing unit address and the case of Guinea Bissau, yeah. where um, state actors, specifically the military, are very much involved in securing and protecting um, actors involved in drug trafficking. So, how can we address? Because, for example, this is also the case of Honduras and Guatemala, yeah. where both of the states are heavily infiltrated yeah. uh, by our organized crime. And so, in both of these countries, we've seen truth between gangs. And how 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 can we how can we aspire, let's say, to better security? Maybe this could be done through negotiating with criminal actors. But when fragile states are themselves involved in criminal activity, yeah. Yeah. Um, how how can we address this? I think it's one of the most complex policy questions we, we face. Frankly, uh, uh, there are many states. Uh, and you have mentioned some in Central America and some in West Africa which are compromised. Uh, the reality is that the international community often has to work with state actors. Uh, so uh, the international community often engages directly with the state actors, providing training uh, uh, and inputs to, to strengthen the state. My view is we need to do more than that. We need to uh, uh, empower civil society, for example. Uh, we need to empower the media, uh, uh, the journalists, in a number of countries have played a very important role in the fight against organized crime, simply by exposing uh, organized crime. But this is very, very dangerous work. Um, but I think the sense that, uh, uh, that, I think two points to be made. Firstly, none of these issues, I, we are fooling ourselves if the response to these things is short term. There has to be a long term commitment both to build the institutions of governance, but also to build civil society and community responses. Uh, to, uh, to organize crime. There are not, I think there's not enough innovation in the programming sphere here. Uh, um, and I think, uh, I think often people trying to provide assistance 
their solutions are, are too easy and too focused. And I think what, what's requiring too simplistic, not because they don't want to assist, but that's how uh, the delivery of technical assistance, the delivery of development assistance often works. So I think we need much greater innovation in the space. And that means, in my view, bolstering civil society, understanding how to change uh, incentives for the engagement in organized crime, as well as bolstering state uh, uh, institutions. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's also an issue of impunity, frankly. And uh, um, so I think there's a, a combination of responses is required, uh, including uh, uh, ending impunity for, for prominent in individuals involved in, in, in illicit trafficking. Thank you. Well, my final question to you, um, is related to, well, let's say, um, public security forces in developing countries. And um, particularly in 2001, Francis Stewart coined the term horizontal inequalities mm -hmm. and to describe the coincidence of cultural, ethnic, and racial differences on one hand, and on the other hand, political and economic inequality. Yeah. And so you have that postings as a policymaker and as a researcher in South Africa. What would you say are the challenges of reforming public security forces in societies yeah. marked by horizontal inequalities? I mean, I think one of the one of the key issues in terms of reforming public security forces is that of legitimacy, and uh, the South African case is a is a very important and a very interesting one. But there were enormous efforts made to improve the legitimacy of the policing instruments post-1994. It began before, uh, but it could only really be get underway uh, to make the, the, the police institutions representative. And remember, these were institutions, particularly the police, but also other parts of the state, uh, that had suppressed people, that did not uh, secure communities, but controlled communities. And I think a lot of work was done. Now, some of that work was successful. There has been an attempt to build relations between communities and the police. The reality is that inequality, uh, um, I think, has kept a distance between people and the police. Because the police have to and have been used uh, um, in a variety of ways when they are protested by, by very poor people, for example. And so the police become uh, the, the ordering institution of the state. And so many of the issues of legitimacy, despite the fact that there's been 20 years of democracy, many of the issues of legitimacy of the police have not uh, uh, been solved. Um, and related to that, in very violent societies, where, a lot of, where there are a lot of weapons, where people resort to violence easily, South Africa partly falls some of those criteria, there are other Latin American countries that do that as well, that the contest, that, that the connections between people and police are often quite violent and driven by a degree of violence, and that undercuts the legitimacy. So I think uh, the, the, the reality is that in the context of South Africa, that building the legitimacy of, of police institutions a lot of work has been done, but there are still key challenges remaining. And one of those key challenges, I have to say, is, is the policing of public order. It's the policing of large groups of people. Um, it's making sure that demonstrations take place peacefully. Um, it's making sure that people have a right to protest. Now, those were some of the things that apartheid was overthrown to achieve. And there are certain ironies now that the, the police are struggle to contain uh, uh, the, the, the protests, legitimate protests that, that people had. So I think these will be key institutions for the police uh, uh, going forward. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. That's great, thank you. Um, well, this is all for this interview, but thank you for watching. Um, if you could not make the conference, all the panels have been recorded and the podcast will be up on the website. And furthermore, stay posted on the social media outlets because we will also be releasing a final report with original articles.